All right, everyone. Um, I've got eight o'clock on uh, my time here in Ottawa. Uh, my name is Tracy and I'm just here to introduce uh, tonight's uh, speaker series. So this is the next installment of our Let's Talk Orienteering speaker series. Um, and tonight we're going to be uh, doing two short presentations. So one is on uh, skio and mountain bike -o, um, and we have some of our athletes presenting. Uh, so we're going to learn uh, about skio from athletes Neela and Robbie, who have both skied at the skio World Cup. And we're going to start with Molly and Randy, who are going to present about mountain bike O and their recent international races in Denmark. Um, if you would please uh, make sure that you are muted, and this is being recorded as well, so you can come back and, and uh, look at these or share with other people that weren't uh, available tonight. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Molly. Hello. Do you want me to share a screen? <laughs> Welcome everyone. So uh, Molly and I are, are going to share our, our, uh, our experience with uh, mountain bike orienteering. We're, we're relatively new to the sport. Um, and it was just a few years ago that uh, we asked the question, what is mountain bike orienteering? And uh, I guess the, the, the short answer to that question is, is uh, it's about a 10 or 20 kilometer expert novice course done at warp speed on a bicycle. And, uh, what it, because of that, it makes it really quite challenging. Uh, after a grueling schedule of about three events over two years, Molly and I decided we were ready for the big league. And uh, so we organized a trip last year in 2019 uh, to uh, participate in the mountain bike orienteering at Oringen, uh, followed by the World Mountain Bike Cha Championships uh, in Denmark, Vibol Denmark, uh, but just as spectators. It was 11 events in 13 days. So we, we were in Sweden, Denmark and Norway for the whole trip was four and a half weeks. We brought our bikes over from Canada. Um, we started in Oringen in Linköpin, Sweden. There were five stages, three middle races and two longs. Um, for, we didn't know what to expect when we went because we've only been doing foot orienteering before and they actually had the arena in the middle of two maps. And so one, one day the runners would be on one side and then the bikers would be on the other and then they would swap the second day. And, and then, so the, we had the same arena for two days and then we would move arenas. And it actually worked out really well that way. The second part of our trip um, uh, was to the World Mountain Bike Orienteering Championships uh, in Vibo, Denmark. Uh, the spectator races were part of the event and there was probably about three to 400 participants in the spectator races. Uh, we had the uh, luxury of staying in the same accommodation as the, uh, the world champ uh, athletes. And uh, that really added to the experience. Um, we got to eat with them and uh, really got to know some of the, uh, some of the teams. Um, our, uh, the uh, championship events were in the mornings and then our events would be scheduled in the afternoons. And so that allowed us to be able to watch uh, most of the events. Um, the six races that uh, we participated, participated in at, uh, at uh, the Worlds were the, was, one was a sprint, there were two middles one long, uh, we had a mass start, and then they finished the week. The sixth race was a chasing start. Down there. So how we traveled was we rented a cargo van and we just lived out of the van. We would tent at the different competition sites. And the beauty of the cargo van was that we could fit both our bikes in without uh, taking them apart. And if the weather was bad, we could also take the bikes out and sleep in them, uh, which was quite handy. So just briefly, quick rules about mountain bike orienteering. 
Uh, it's mandatory to bring your bike to each control. You're not allowed to leave your bike at the bottom of a hill, run up and come back down. Uh, your bicycle must not be battery powered. There are no clothing requirements. You are not allowed off trail unless told. And if you're told you can go off trail, um, the little segment of the map at the bottom is dark yellow and that is where you're, at, you're allowed to bike on that. And it's, um, we were allowed to bike off trails uh, in the arenas and on the sprint maps. So for equipment, you have two choices of bikes. You can have a hardtail, which is front shock, and a full suspension, which is front and back shocks. There are three different kinds of compasses. All three are displayed in the images. You use an SI Air Dibbler that you wear on your wrist. Some people wear them on their fingers. A helmet is mandatory, and there's different types of map holders, but the most popular one is 12 by 12. So, uh, like uh, like regular photo orientation maps, the, the, there is quite a, a lengthy document that describes the specifications for mountain bike orienteering maps. Um, but basically, there there are two types of features on MTBL maps. There's the route choice features, which is predominantly the trails and anything you would use uh, to travel on, and then there were navigation features, which might be buildings, the type of forest and cliffs, and, and they were uh, only large cliffs rather, but uh, they were somewhat subdued on the map so that they didn't uh, complicate uh, reading the, uh, the um, trail networks. So for the trails, which is what I'm gonna concentrate over the next couple of slides, there are basically uh, two, two types of, of, of uh, trails. There's the track and the path. A track is considered uh, 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 a trail that is wider than 1.5 meters, and the 1.5 meters is rideable surface. So even if you have grass cut on the side of a trail, if the trail itself is less than 1.5, it would obviously be considered a path. And the way they uh, distinguish the two on the map is the track is a thicker line than the path. Then they have four categories of, of uh, tracks and paths, which are really defined by speed. So a solid black line, whether fat or thin, would uh, imply that you can ride up to 75 to 100% of your maximum speed. Uh, so there would be very few uh, barriers, uh, the riding surface would be quite smooth, etc. cetera. Uh, medium riding, uh, it's uh, a longer dash than the others. Uh, the expectation is you would be able to ride 50 to 75% of your maximum speed. And then slow riding, uh, again, a smaller dash, 25 to 50. And then the uh, dots at the bottom are the difficult to ride. Um, and that would be where you would have a lot of rocks, a lot of drops, um, and uh, bumpy surfaces, that sort of thing. So here's an example of a, uh, a track with, uh, at fast, uh, with a fast riding uh, speed. Um, Obviously, you can, you can uh, pedal really as fast as you can go on this, this section. Um, and uh, the same with the, uh, the less than, or the path, which is less than 1.5 meters. You can really pedal as fast as you can. So here you have uh, a, a track which is fast riding, but uh, at a junction with a medium riding path. And uh, you can see the, the, the significant difference between the, tra the, the track and the path here, but what's also important is that when they have a junction um, on a map, uh, they uh, are required to ensure that the lines actually touch, so that if the lines are not touching, the implication is, is that the, the path really doesn't have a junction with uh, whatever other trail or, or, or track it, it is uh, connecting with. Now recall that the bottom one is the dots and difficult to ride and it's a maximum 25%. Quite often uh, when you uh, go on a, a dotted tr uh, track or path, uh, quite often you have to get off the bike and, uh, and sometimes even have to carry it. So uh, often you would avoid these, these type of, uh, of uh, trails simply because the, the, you would lose a lot of time. So here's an example of a a dotted uh, path, if you were to come into this path at full speed, uh, well, God help you when you go off the edge. 
Um, there's even a corner uh, after the after the uh, the drop, um, and that is a drop of about 10 meters. Here we have uh, the uh, MTBL map for the middle race uh, for the world champs. Um, this is uh, near the coast, uh, the, I guess the west east coast of uh, of Denmark, Ebeltoft. Uh, it was a wonderful facility, sort of a, a packed dirt um, uh, uh, venue. Um, and what I want to show you with uh, the next few slides is how mountain bike orienteering is more than just uh, uh, an area with great single track riding. So on the, on the left is a brochure that we picked up at the visitor center, which basically uh, highlights the single track uh, mountain bike trail that is available uh, in this area. On the right, that single, single track mountain bike trail is actually incorporated uh, into the mountain bike orienteering map. So all those additional uh, trails and, uh, that you see on the, on the MTBO map are either uh, you know, fairly significant uh, uh, gravel roads, which is the lo long solid dash line going north to south, but also uh, cuts through the forest, probably something to do with uh, a previous um, uh, harvesting of the trees in the area. But it, you can see that um, when you when you look for the single track on the MTBO map, it's sometimes hard to actually distinguish. So, Randy, yeah, we just have a quick question here. Yeah. Um, so someone actually was Anne with Jeff um, wanted to know what the gray behind the dotted track lines are on some of the maps. Uh, I'm not really certain. Um, the it may be just to highlight the uh, uh, the uh, the track, or it might imply that it was a sandy uh, sandy track. But I I really don't know. Mm. Thanks, Jenny. So next, we're gonna have you guys do a little exercise. So here is one of our controls from Ebeltoff, nine to ten. So we're gonna give you. Uh, up to seven seconds to pick your route. So we we decided that there were two routes that were the two the two best routes. So we actually both took the purple route. Um, there, I think they the green route was a hundred meters longer. Yeah, the, the, the purple route is a total of 650 meters, and then the green route, uh, probably because of all the squiggles, is about 100 meters more. So my dad actually beat me on this one. Um, here, here. <laughs> so one thing you have to account for when you're mountain bike going terrain is when you, you have to plan for exiting the control, because turning around your bike, it takes time. You have to unclip and spin it around and... Um, you, you have to stop. So SIR, you don't have to put your foot down to punch, but if you have to turn around, uh, you're losing time. So exiting 10 to 11, um, we both, one of us took the green route, one of us took the purple route. And <laughs> one of us. <laughs> so the, the good thing about going the green route is that you don't, you're not risking the, the dotted um trail coming out of 10 and i took the purple route and my dad took the green route and i was lucky and the purple dotted line wasn't actually that bad whereas my dad had to turn his bike around and then he had to climb up the hill and um so you never know <laughs> so this is um a map the long distance map from oringen so our map was one to 15. We had two maps on this course. And I just wanted to show that mountain bike uh, distances between controls are, can be very long. So from two to three, it was 2.8 as the crow flies. And I ended up going six kilometers. About a few races into O-Ring-In, we determined that whatever the course distance 
um, in the in the course description, it was going to be double, we're going to bike double the distance. So we were averaging, I think, 20 to 25 kilometers a day. And uh, the thing about bike orienteering is that it's it's not like mountain bike orienteering. It's easier. It's not you're not going single track for seven kilometers. It's um, it's much easier. So 25 kilometers. If you were to ask me to ma mountain bike 25 kilometers before this trip, I would have been like, no way. But after this trip, it's doable for sure. So so here I just wanted to uh, quickly talk about three to four. Um, this was one of my controls and. I was not sure if I should take the purple or green route. Um, I ended up taking the purple route because I thought it was going to be shorter and I gambled on the uh, middle path, the, the, the road, not road path being uh, not too hard. I actually did lose the trail at one point, so I'm really not sure if, if that was the right route, but oh well. So future plans, uh, Molly and I had intentions of attending the World Mountain Bike uh, Orienteering Championships as competitors this time. Molly was going to participate in the, um, uh, the oh man, 21, no, women's 21. And uh, I would have participated in the spectator events, but unfortunately it got canceled. Uh, they are going to have a, a, a World Mountain Bike Orienteering Championship, but it'll be part of a, an event in Portugal in the fall. Um, so they will get one in this year, but uh, not uh, not uh, in Czech. Um, so for next year, uh, the plans are to attend uh, the World Mountain Bike Orienteering Championships in Finland. And uh, um, uh, we're very much looking forward to that because uh, we also will be able to visit Emily. Um, the uh, World Masters uh, are in Slovenia in the spring. Uh, the uh, worlds in June, uh, but then uh, uh, in July is O-Ringen. And next year's O-Ringen was supposed to be this year's O-Ringen. So it is going to be in Uppsala. Um, and the beauty of, uh, of this particular event is that all five uh, MTBO events are within a 15 minute bike ride from the O-Ringen city. Um, and uh, for those of you who, who have attended O'Ringen, um, uh, that's, that's pretty luxurious uh, in terms of uh, getting around to be able to just ride to your event. Um, and, uh, and also the terrain around Uppsala is pretty exceptional. Here in Ottawa, uh, we've got a couple of maps uh, sort of uh, uh, targeted for uh, mountain bike orienteering. Uh, I, I'm, Going to be doing a sprint event at uh, Britannia Park in the near future. Um, I've always thought McCarthy Woods would, uh, for those of you who know it, it's an inner city sort of forest area. Uh, not uh, not exceptional orienteering, but fun orienteering. We often run our summer solstice events there, uh, but I think it'd be a great opportunity to do a mountain bike orienteering event there. Uh, some other maps, uh, Constance Bay has a great network of of uh, roads and trails and major uh, major tracks uh, for from ATVs etc. I think that's a fabulous venue. Uh, we can incorporate some of the um, uh, the residential uh, and the periphery of the of the map. Uh, and then we've uh, recently converted uh, the La Rose Forest map into an MTBO map, and we ran an event there last fall. We also have Montreal uh, working on some MTBO maps, so we're looking forward to traveling to Montreal for some events uh, in the near future. And uh, that's our story. Thanks, Randy and Molly. That was awesome. We got um, a nice question there from Anne and Jeff. Um, hold on, there's one more question before you leave. Um, Randy, can you tell people about the foot? Oh, hold on. Randy, can you tell people about the winter bike O? <laughs> well, I've never done a winter bike O, but it, I, I can't see uh, why you, you, you couldn't do it. If you had um, a, a significant dedicated uh, group of dog walkers in the neighborhood to help pack down the trails. I'm a, I'm a big fat bike uh, rider, uh, Molly too. And um, uh, 
I think mountain biking in the winter would be uh, would be fabulous. Now that said, we did do a um, uh, uh, fat bike go, I guess, uh, on the S Jam, which is this, the uh, winter trails that they groom for cross country skiing and walking, I guess, uh, along the river. And uh, so yes, we did uh, we did uh, we did sort of uh, do a, a hybrid event as part of uh, this year's um, skio on, on the Otter River pathways. And before you go, there's still a couple more questions here. So Pia would like to know how much effort and time is needed to adapt, adapt a foot O map to a bike O map? Well, that's a good question because the new OCAD, uh, OCAD for orienteering program uh, says that it, it will do it automatically. Um, we haven't uh, tried it yet, but uh, uh, we're, we're looking at, uh, at how to do that. At the end of the day, I, I, I would suspect that, that the program will probably do between 50 and 60% of the work, and then the remaining 40% would be field checking and ensuring that the trail designations or the symbology that, that, that the program you know, is interpreting is correct. Um, it's my understanding that um, uh, the, uh, the connections, the trail connections, how the trails connect to each other and how they're represented on the map is, is really quite critical. Um, and and uh, you can't underestimate how difficult it is to do orienteering at high speed on a bicycle. It, it really is much more challenging uh, than you would, you would think. Uh, it's, 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 it's really hard to keep track of, of where you are because distances uh, uh, are covered so quickly. And uh, so, you know, the map, the, the trail network represented on the map really needs to be accurate. So there is a bit of, you know, a bit of, you know, pounding the pavement, so to speak, to get the map right. But uh, once you've got your trail network, I, you know, I think it's, 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 it's quite doable. Great. And then the last question here is a bit of a two-part question. So the first part is, uh, Emily would like to know, do the map holders turn or do you orient your map? And then the second part of her question is, can you just talk a little bit more um, about the compass? Do you wear it on your person or mount it on your map? So maybe if you could just talk about those technical aspects. Sure, so the, the map holder turns 360. Um, otherwise, if it stayed still, that would be disastrous. Um, usually you actually have more than one map. You're give, like we, we would have up to four maps. And so the, the map holders, they have clips. And so you have to clip the maps in and then partway through you have to unclip them and um, some people, it, when we were watching the, the walk athletes, they were doing it while riding and um, some were riding into the control or like, like it's, it's, you have to practice actually. Um, but yeah, they turn 360 and the compasses. So there's, we saw like, I think it's really personal preference, but they have, I don't think we saw anybody with a compass on their map. Um, because your map, your map uh, holder is on a slant. And so you can, you can get a little compass that sits on your palm. And the pro of that is when you hold your, the handlebars, your, your palm is usually flat. You, most people wear it on their wrist. Um, but then some people, they also have, it's hooked on the side of their thumb. I don't know how much, some people, and then some people don't even have compasses. They're, they're not used as much as foot orienteering because you can orient with the trail. Um, person, like both of us wear them on our wrists. And um, yeah, you, I think it's just trying them out and, and seeing what uh, you prefer personally. Great. Thank you both so much for your presentation. And we got some great questions come out of that. So. Um, thank you again very much, and I'm going to pass it over to Robbie and Mila now.
Not exactly. I can't. Oh, I can't see. <laughs> Oops. Just having some technical difficulties. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, can everyone see that? Sweet. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm uh, Robbie Graham here with uh, Mila Tornopolsky, um, and uh, we're going to tell you about Skio. So what is skier and cheering? Um, it's a bit of an interesting sport. It's what happens when you combine two strange sports, one being cross-country skiing uh, and the other being orienteering. And the product is a sort of weird hybrid that is ski orienteering. Um, it, can be, it can often appear quite goofy at times, uh, but it's actually super fun. Um, it's got a lot of benefits, so cross-country skiers alone are among the fittest athletes out there. Uh, they have crazy high VO2 maxes, um, they can ski forever and climb up these hills, they're quite incredible. Uh, and then combined with the mental aspect of orienteering, it really produces a sport that offers quite a unique challenge. Um, yeah, and skio is more fun than just skiing because, of course, you get to orienteer. Um, and for many Canadians, it's also the only way to orienteer during the winter because everything's covered in snow. Um, but if you do do it all winter, uh, then come springtime, you'll be more than ready uh, to jump back into the woods with uh, quite an advantage. Yeah, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the maps. Uh, essentially, we can see on this slide here that there's a pretty big difference. I would say, judging by what we just heard about mountain bike orienteering, um, it's more similar ski orienteering, I would say, map-wise to mountain bike orienteering. Um, but as, as you can see, they're, they, they're a lot more simple. Like they, they're, they take out a lot of the features because obviously everything's covered in snow. So like the, the maps themselves are, are pretty blank in that respect. Um, but the trails are a lot more obvious because um, topography and just like the trails themselves are really huge component of the race in comparison to foot orienteering. Um, but yeah, we'll see a little bit about the trails on the next slide. Um, there we go, sweet. Um, so once again, actually quite similar to mountain bike orienteering, we have like a big variety of um, width of the trail. So the very super thick lines, super obvious, super awesome trails are, um, usually you could even go two people um, it's like super wide, super fast skiing. Um, it's like the, take those trails if you can sort of thing. Um, those are the super bold ones. And then we have the slightly less wide tracks, um, as you can see in the lower left hand side. Um, those you can skate on. Um, so it's not like the traditional classic necessarily, um, but we double pull because we're not on classic skis. Um, but then the dash lines are just double pullable trails. So in the picture here, you can see that there's a classic track um, put in there, but I would say about 50% of the time you don't actually see that. It's just a snowmobile trail. Um, so you're pretty much stuck double pulling and maybe doing herringbone, which is like awkwardly shuffling your skis up a hill. Um, so definitely a lot slower. Um, and then the last one is usually a snowshoe trail or something of that vein. And it's just dots, pretty slow. And you also risk um, like rocks, fruits. I've had races where there's not a lot of snow in the woods and I've definitely destroyed some skis that way. So those are definitely a little bit um, scarier of the tracks. Um, but there's a couple cool features that are pretty unique um, to scary tearing that we'll see on the next slide, um, which are one-way trails, um, so, which are just those little the lines you have to go that direction. So that's like one way they really complicate route choice. Um, as well as sometimes they'll even put, um, we don't have it here, but they put X's, like red X's on the trails and that they're cutting off a section of the trail. So once again, to either add distance to a route choice or make it more complicated. Um, another difference is that we don't have control descriptions in the same way that photo, photo does. So there's a dash line that gives you the control, like the box number. 
Um, that's, so it makes the map look a little different, a little bit more cluttered, if you will. Um, there's also roads on the map that are sometimes skiable, sometimes they take them out of bounds depending on the race, but like you, you could do it. Sometimes people double pull along the side of a road, um, but that's a sure way sometimes to destroy your skis. Um, and then the prepared area, as you can see in the bottom right, is usually a sort of stadium or like a, they sort of almost make it a little bit like a maze, um, usually to start and finish the race, um, just so it, it's a bit more spectator friendly. So that's pretty neat. Um, and then next, I'll talk a bit about equipment. Um, so we have map trays, sort of similar to what they're talking about with mountain biking, but it attaches to your chest. Um, it moves in all directions, so it goes up and down. The actual tray like slides in and out, so it's, it's, you have a lot of different visuals, and then it spins 360 degrees. Um, and then usually you'll attach your compass, if you can see on that little metal part at the bottom where the tray goes up and down, usually people just have their compass taped on there. Um, or sometimes taped on the bottom corner of the map tray. Um, because compasses aren't as huge as they are in, uh, in foot orienting, just because the trails, you usually orient your map according to the trails, you don't usually, usually need a compass. Um, but the map tray is definitely the most important piece of equipment, most unique piece of equipment, because it allows you to use your poles and ski properly. Um, but yeah, and then next, we have really weird baskets. So I'm not sure how many people listening here have uh, Nordic skied before, but as you can see on the far left, that's what a normal basket, they're pretty small. They're only about this big um, because you're always skiing on those nice, big, thick, like big, wide, hard packed, well-groomed trails. Um, but for ski orienteering, we need really quite large brimmed baskets that sometimes can be about this big. Um, and so that's when you're going through the forest on particularly snowy, particularly snowy races, um, just so you don't fall in as much. Cause there's a lot of double pull technique, um, which is big upper body usage um, in ski orienteering. And so that these baskets make it a lot easier. Uh, next, we ha really rely heavily on an SI air system um, because just because of the speed, I would say it's, I would say in most conditions, skiing varies a lot depending on the snow, but in most conditions, it's quite fast and they like to put controls um, in places that almost force you to ski through the control. Um, and so SIR is a really uh, wonderful tool that we have. So it makes flow of punch, uh, like the flow of reading your map a lot easier because you just can ski right through the control. And punching is a lot easier because when you have poles on, you don't want something on your finger and having to stop and like use that. It's not really super fun. Um, for skis, our skis are pretty much quite similar to Nordic racing. As you can see at the bottom, those are, I would say probably the top of the line racing skis that you can see on Nordic cir uh, circuits right now. Um, the only difference that we have um, and ski orienteering is sometimes people like to shorten up their skis. This makes it easier for the off trailing. I've definitely taken some really fantastic wipeouts by getting the tip of my ski stuck in deep snow. Um, also, it, sometimes having like really expensive or gorgeous skis like the one you see on the slide can be um, not as beneficial for ski orienteering because I've made the mistake of destroying <laughs> Um, a really nice pair of skis just due to the terrain. Um, there's a lot of, sometimes if you don't have the right snow conditions and you're going through the forest, you'll hit roots, you'll hit rocks. It's not the most wonderful, just sometimes due to snow conditions. So those are probably the only big differences. Um, also, you can see on these, on these skis, I've seen this a few times, is that people will duct tape the holes at the end of their skis so that they don't get sticks stuck through it. But that's about it for the differences there. Um, but yeah, I guess now I'll throw it over to Robbie talking about races. Yeah, so um, there are the disciplines in skill are short and fast. You know, you need to have uh, really precise navigation skills, make quick decisions because there's a lot of tight turns and you got to keep the pace up. Um, winning time is usually around 12 minutes. 
Uh, for the middle, it tends to be more technical. Um, a lot of forest cuts, trail mazes, um, and they can have multiple maps. Um, winning time is usually 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and then the long distance, you're practically guaranteed to have at least one map exchange, just because in skio, you ski a uh, much longer distance than you would in um, photo, typically. Um, so there are a lot of long legs, just like in regular photo, they'll bring you, you know, all the way across the map. And you might do that um, two or three times, uh, depending on how, how small the area is. Um, so endurance and route choice is critical for that because um, the winning time is 90 minutes. So you're going to be up there for a long time. So um, choices you make can really impact how much, how much time you'll spend out there. Um, and then there's two types of relays. There's your standard um, three-person relay, like in FUDO, three men and three women. Uh, but there's also a sprint relay, which is a little different from FUDO. Um, it's just a team of two, one man and one woman. So the woman starts and then hands off to the man. Um, and then they each do two more loops. So you have a total of six times that one team will be going out. Um, and these usually end off the week of racing and they're always high energy, super fun. Um, each loop is relatively short legs. Um, and it's yeah, just super fun to race and super fun to watch. So I'm going to run through a typical start procedure. Um, at minus four minutes or so, you'll be called up to the start area. Um, and then you'll put around for a little bit. And then at minus 15 seconds, so not a long time before your start, is when they give you the map. So you only have 15 seconds to get the map in your map holder, orient it, get your poles ready, and get to the start gate before you have to go. Um, and with all the adrenaline pumping and people yelling, it can be <laughs> a little bit interesting. <laughs> I've dropped my map more than once. Um, and depending on the discipline, it's either an interval start or a mass start. Um, so for the interval starts, it usually sprints. Um, and what they do is they put you through a starting gate, just like in other skiing events. Um, and once your countdown goes, then you're allowed to pass through and this will open and that'll register that your time has started. Um, for the other distances, they have mass starts, which are super fun. Um, again, they still only give you a, you're all, they hand the maps out maybe one minute before the start and then 15 seconds before you're allowed to pick it up, put it in your map tray um, and then get going. And that can even be uh, a little more stressful because you got people in front of you, people behind you who are more than ready to run you over if you're not ready to go. Um, so unlike mountain bike go, um, in skio you actually are allowed to go off trail, but it can be a little hairy. Uh, I, Randy was mentioning uh, he almost went off a cliff. Uh, I've done that in skio and uh, it was incredibly terrifying. Um, so yeah, you are allowed to do it in competition, but you should know what you're getting yourself in, into. Um, and as we saw earlier in the maps, a lot of the features in the forest are moved, so um, cliffs aren't present often on skio maps. Um, and it's possible to break through the snow or get tangled in trees and bushes and get yourself stuck. Um, you're also allowed to take off your skis and poles and run during the race, uh, but they must be with you at all times. So you're not allowed to drop your, your gear somewhere and then run the course and then pick it up later. Now you have to bring it to every control and to the finish. So in 2018, Mila and I were at the uh, World Cup. Um, which for the first time in a long time, maybe ever, I'm not sure, it was in North America. Grassbury, right close to home. Um, so it was me and Mila and Alex Bergstrom. Uh, we went there to compete. It was super fun. Uh, we were a small team, just the three of us, plus uh, coach slash wax, wax tech Mark. Um, small team, but it's not often that Canada sends anyone to um, these types of uh, international ski races. So, so we were super happy to be there and uh, to represent the uh, Maple Leaf. So the week of races uh, went by, it was super fun. And at the end of the week was the sprint relay. Uh, super fun. Um, 
like I said before, the short little loops, uh, a lot of high energy. Um, it was really a lot of fun handing off and then, you know, getting a little break before going back out again. A lot of skiers all over the place. Um, and as you can see, uh, I was pretty tired by the end of it. Um, I was trying to uh, out sprint some of the Americans and uh, we did okay. A little far down the result list, but I'm happy to say that we beat both of the American teams. So <laughs> KAB, if you know what that means. And uh, here's a little uh, map snippet of the uh, M21 uh, sprint relay. So those are the three forkings, the three loops that I did. Um, so you guys can uh, all, all look at those. And uh, I think that's all we have for you today. If anyone has any questions, you can ask them. Thank you. Just let everybody take a look at the map and I don't see any questions in our chat, but we'll just give everybody a couple minutes. All right, we have a couple questions here. So Jeff wants to know what ski events uh, do you two have coming up uh, this coming winter? Um, I was, unfortunately due to COVID, <laughs> I was supposed to race um, the university, uh, steering, steering, like World University Champs. Unfortunately that got canceled. So hopefully next year it'll be the same idea um, to be able to race Universiad for Skio. Um, I also did Empire State Games in February. So that was the last race I got to participate in this year. And hopefully that was a really fun experience. Um, super close to home, just took a car down with my dad. Um, hopefully we'll do something like that again next year. Um, but I guess we'll just see how things open up in the ski season to come. Yeah, I'm sort of in the same boat as Mila. Um, <laughs> the uh, quarantine sort of crushed all my plans. Uh, I was just planning on doing, I wasn't planning on doing any inter international races though. I was just gonna do some local races in Ottawa, maybe head down to um, Northeastern US, like New York, do some races down there. In um, uh, Mount Van Hoogenberg, they have a really excellent ski center with a really dense trail network. I raced there before and it's super fun. So anytime I get to go down to uh, that area of the U.S. it's always really good ski orienting. All right, I have another question here. So Emma wants to know at the start and end of the season, how long does it take to transition between styles of orienteering? I find the transition, like if you've been doing a lot of ski orienteering, um, it's definitely easier to get back into the orienteering, foot orienteering groove because you've been practicing your navigation. Um, but other, that's not really, uh, yeah, and then also with the, uh, the physical aspect of Nordic skiing keeps you in great shape so you can really stride up those hills no problem. So yeah. great cross training. Yeah, I would definitely say the transition to ski orienteering, per, like this is just a personal thing. I'm not a very big foot orienteer um, comparison wise. So uh, the transition from summer season or um, like before the snow comes is a lot easier. Like once the snow's here, I'm, I'm much faster to get on um, a ski orienteering map. But the transition from the ease I find of ski orienteering to foot orienteering is sometimes a little bit more difficult just because the, the technicality of foot o is a lot greater in my opinion. So that's, I guess, just a personal thing. Great, Emily wants to know how common is it to go off trail? Uh, I would say probably, I've, def I've definitely done it recently I did it a few times at the last race I was at um I think it's it depends on where you are and how much snow there is because there's definitely races where you 
you're going along and you think to yourself, wow, there's a huge snow bank. If there was less snow, I would definitely cut here. But like due to the conditions, it's very condition dependent because um, trudging through a lot of thick, um, powdery, deep snow is not a great option. Um, but if it's pretty um, lacking of snow, which it was when I was in Finland a few years ago when I totally destroyed my skis, is definitely smart. Just take skis off, run through the run through the bush, put the mac on the other side, and go. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, if, if you're going a short distance, definitely it can be worth it. Like if you guys see on the map here, north of 121, if you were to be coming down this trail, um, it could definitely be worth it to just cut through the little uh, slaloms here and go down. Actually, um, when we were in Crossbury, the first few days we had like, like the snow was all melting and it was looking really bad. And there was one point uh, somewhere on the west end of the course yeah, this is a grassy area. There was no snow and just grass. So there are people literally running with their skis on through the grass. Uh, it, was, it was pretty funny to watch. Um, I think I wiped out when I tried that. Uh, but yeah, um, cutting through is uh, quite common in Skido. <clears throat> All right, we have another question here. So Pia wants to know, is taking the direction you are leaving the control into an account as important as in Bico, or is it okay to turn around and she's thinking about creating a pile up of skiers? Um, I would say it's pretty, it's probably easier to turn around in skiering. Tearing, I definitely would say we're probably not going quite as fast as bikes, but it's definitely huge to take into account how you, how, like which way you're entering a control, um, especially if it's the small trails, because as you can see by the map up here, a lot of the controls are on the the dotted trails, which are not like they're they're pretty narrow. They're not very easy to turn around in. So I I definitely would recommend planning a route choice in advance so that you can you can hit a control in the direction you want to exit the trail in. Um, turning around has definitely led to um, a couple wipeouts. And yeah, when people are bombing, especially down like on a down slope, if you're turning around, it could lead to a pileup for sure. So that's definitely super important. All right, and then speaking of narrow trails, uh, do you like them or do they intimidate you? And then how do you manage your speed on a downhill narrow trail when snow plowing doesn't work well? Um, I would say they're pretty fun now, but I do remember when I was a little younger, uh, my first like international big race, I was 16 and I was in Europe and the Europeans have a lot less fear than I do and they bomb down those trails and I, I'll admit I was a little afraid. The um, amount of technical skill you need, because I, I come from a Nordic skiing background, the amount of technical skill you need ski orienteering is a lot greater. Um, you definitely, managing your balance on your skis is, is a lot lot more of a big component on these smaller trails so yeah it's definitely intimidating at first if you come from a strict nordic skiing background but it's something to train and it's it's really fun once you get used to it um but snow plowing on the um steep downhills i would say i i've had a couple instances that have scared me a bit um but i think also just planning maybe if you're a bit afraid of a certain one maybe going on a bigger trail, it's hard to say, but um, it's usually pretty manageable. All right, we have one last question here. And Marquetta wants to know, how do you keep track of where you are on the map since you cannot use your thumb? She says, share your tricks, please. I would say I probably rely on mm, mental, pre like mental, mm, I don't know, I'm trying to think of how to say this, like a, a pre-plan that I think of in my head. So in, in like, cause you can't use your, your thumbs. I usually think of like, I plan that I'm going to turn left, right. You know, those sort of forks and oh, it's, it's hard to, it's a strange thing to put into words. Um, yeah, map memory. Yeah, like map memory and also just 
like saying it in in my head I guess I I think it's one of those things that I definitely at the beginning of the season it's it that's a great thing to uh, bring up because at the beginning of the season I noticed that a lot more that I'll sometimes lose myself a little bit and I'm like whoa whoa where's and then you know get back into it that's definitely a early season getting back into the map sort of thing that I've experienced um I think it's a it's a thing that comes a bit with time um but yeah <laughs> that's great so I think we've answered everything in the chat um I hope that everyone who joined us this evening has enjoyed our speaker series. Um, I know we're enjoying putting them on. I just want to thank Mila, Robbie, Molly, and Randy for your presentation, your stories, your uh, sharing. And with that, we will um, hopefully see many of you on our next series coming up in the next few weeks. And if you just watch our social media, we'll have uh, the next speaker series uploaded soon and this will be posted to our YouTube. So thank you again, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you, presenters.